Welcome to the new Fly Fisher. We're here in Rhode Island today with two of the best captains in the area, Captain Jim Barr and Captain Mike Warkey. We're catching striped bass. You're gonna learn all about how to catch striped bass in coastal Rhode Island. Stay, stay with us and we're gonna have a lot of fun. Let him go back to live another day. And away he goes. Great fish. Wow. Oh, baby. Look at that fish. Stop, wiggle, on the way down. The new Fly Fisher has been made possible thanks to Islander Precision Reels and Orvis Sporting Traditions. On today's show, we fish for striped bass along the coast of beautiful Rhode Island. Joining me is my friend Captain Jim Barr of Skinny Water Charters, an Orvis endorsed fishing guide and certified casting instructor for the Federation of Fly Fishers. Jim's specialty is fly fishing shallow water. Later on, another friend, Captain Mike Warkey, joins us. Captain Mike has been fishing the salt water for 30 years. His knowledge and success comes from the commitment of spending countless hours on the water. Also along for the ride is Colin McEwen, producer of the new Fly Fisher. We're here at the best time of the year in my mind to fish for striped bass. This is because the worm hatch is on and the fishing can be outstanding. Cinder worms are slender worms that become elongated and flattened during their annual spawn. When spawning occurs, these mud burrowers leave their safe environment and travel to the surface of the water where they'll swim and mate. These two to four inch cinder worms will propagate their species and then die. As they swim in the upper columns of water, they become the prey of fish and fowl. Striped bass, hickory shad, terns, gulls, and cormorants all find the worms irresistible. So Jim, what kind of flies are we gonna use in here? Can we throw the, can we throw the standard clousers, deceivers, or the flies that work for stripers almost everywhere? Well, not really. No. Uh, we can use them, but we're not gonna be very successful. Okay. Now these fish, these bass, uh, are in here specifically keying on these aquatic worms. And, and these worms, are they live in the mud, and the warmth of the day, beginning in May, releases those worms to the surface. The bass know they're here. They come in from the open water, and, uh, and they're taking specifically these worms. So, no, it's very specific to the hatch, just like you would have in, in freshwater for trout. These uh, worms come in sizes from one inch on the, on the small side to as much as four inches on the larger size. And in colors from a maroon to a brown to a tan to a pink, and so what we're trying to do with these various creations is to imitate as closely as we can the variety uh, of colors and sizes that these worms take on. So this box happens to have a, an assortment of uh, flies that uh, I would use uh, depending upon what we see in the water. Typically, we're seeing the large flies, the big ones, four inches like this at the beginning of the hatch. And for some reason, uh, they go down in size and they change color as the evening goes on. And you can actually get different sizes and different colors at the same time in different coves um, around the pond. So it's a game. And, and the fish are selective to the size and the color of, of the worm of the moment. They are selective. Uh, you can have fish rising all around you, and you think you've got the right fly based on what it looks like versus what you have in your box, and they pass up your fly continuously. So oh it, it can be very difficult. Yeah, anybody that says that fishing the worm hatch is easy hasn't fished it very well. Jim, I noticed um, you're using a loop knot on these flies. Right, right. Is that, what? what's the purpose of using a loop instead of a clinch knot? Well, the clinch thing? knot, you have a straight line, and if you're using uh, 15 to 20 pound mono as your tippet, that's a fairly stiff tippet. So if you're tying a clinch line, you've got a straight line to the loop of the uh, hook, and it doesn't allow the fly to have that much action. Mm -hmm. If you use the loop knot as you've gotten here, uh, you know, when you pause that fly on your retrieve, the current, the wind, or whatever will move Let's that fly. Uh -huh. Yes, right. So it gives it more swing, if you uh -huh. will. And okay. uh, I, th I think it's the most effective uh, not to use. Okay.
Yeah, really. This one's a little bit better fish, I think. There's another. Ooh, nice fish. There's Three. another fish uh, around him here. There's a swirl right there. Okay. That fish just about went under the boat. <laughs> yeah, the only thing you have to worry about are the props, obviously. Yeah. But if you have a big fish and he's threatening to do that, let me know and I'll pull up the... Uh... That's right. Oh, there he goes. No, wow. A, he's on his way to the other end of the pond. Yeah, so I might get into my backing. <laughs> I can see the oar. Oh, damn, not quite into the backing. I want to see this fish. I haven't... Oh, there he is. Yeah, it's a decent fish. Definitely a decent fish. There he is. Weed in his face. Now I think he's ready. The other thing you can do is a real good way of getting a fish like this in close is to give some slack in here and reach over and grab the leader and let go of that slack. It takes all the tension off the tip of your rod. That's a pretty fish. That's a pretty fish. Let's clean you off here first, buddy. There you go. I don't want to be Oh, I got it. Okay. I got it. All right. And then revive him until he's ready, which he told me he was ready. Okay. <laughs> nice fish. The average saltwater retrieve is something like this. That's about six inches per second. And that's what you do most of the time. There are times when you want the fly to move faster. In that case, there's a couple things you could do. One is to really rip that line through the water. The other one is to tuck the rod under your arm and do a hand over hand strip like this. Now, the thing we're doing here, which is yet another type of retrieve, is to crawl the fly along fairly slowly and steadily, because that's what the worms are doing. But when you're saltwater fly fishing, always be flexible, and it's probably better to change your retrieve before you change your fly. Striped bass are a fish-eating carnivore found in estuaries and coastal waters. It's been said that the number of striped bass present can determine the healthiness of a river or water system. It's uncertain how economically important striped bass are, but estimates suggest they have eclipsed the salmon sport fishery. Recreationally, striped bass are a pleasant pastime for some and an obsession for others. Conservation is necessary so that our children and their children can enjoy such a wonderful fish. When you're saltwater fly fishing, it's important to keep that rod tip low. When you're stripping, the fly and when you're striking the fish. You have more control over the line when the rod tip is low. When you want to strike a fish, it's just one long strike, one long strip. It's called a strip strike. And then once you feel the fish, then you can raise the rod tip and play the fish. If you do have problems with raising the rod tip as you would in trout fishing, because it's a tough reflex to get out of, it, it's perfectly okay to put your rod tip right down in the water. That way, you keep that rod tip low, and you can't really strip strike. You can't really raise that rod tip because you've got, you've got resistance on the rod tip, so it really helps you to strip strike. Oh, there, there yeah, like that. You got, him. You got him. <laughs> <laughs> Demonstrated perfectly. That's a little one. Actually, a little, real little one. It's nice to see that, Jim. Nice to see a small fish. Mm-hmm. Yep. Strong, though. Yeah. And then when he goes that way, we go this way. And then when he goes that way, we go this way. And then this way, and then this way. 
being careful not to bring that leader knot inside the guides because that can catch very, even a small fish like this can break your rod. I'm gonna get a little slack here in my hand and I'm gonna pop that leader right into my hand, put, take the pressure off the tip. And give me your mouth. Give me your mouth. There you go, open it up. That's a boy. Good boy. you go. Recommended rods for striper fishing would be nine foot rods with a number nine or 10 weight line. Even small five pound stripers know how to fight very hard and will tax your equipment. These rods will also handle the large weighted and wind resistant flies you'll be casting. The reel you choose First and foremost, we'll need a smooth and dependable drag system. Large arbors are also recommended as they make line retrieval much easier. Line selection will depend on what water you're fishing. For the worm hatch, all you want is a floating line because the fish are feeding near the top. But when you move to deeper water, a full sinking line will be best. The next day we met up with Captain Mike Warkey of Southern Connecticut Fishing Charters. We headed out to deeper water to fish the rips with sand eel patterns. The craft we are fishing is a 19 foot center console that will allow us to fish shallow as well as in moderately heavy seas. Right now we're fishing in about 53 feet of water. And behind us here we have a rip and uh, the rocks come up three, four feet and the water is coming in, so the water's rushing up over the, over the rocks, creating a rip, and we get rough water right, right through here, and these fish are just setting up on the downside of that, as all the sand deals come up over that bar, these fish are setting up in this, in this little bit deeper water, hitting the sand deals as they're on the surface. But those were some nice fish. There you go, good, good job. When I could change, change the angle later and get in the, in the right sun, you'll be able to see it clear. It's in the back here. <laughs> now, now, there's a lot of rocks in here. I don't know if you want me to go after them. We got a double. Oh, there he goes. One more circle. He's tuckered. All right, take a step back. Nice. That, that worked great. So what do you think about? Uh, yeah, let's, let's turn him more this way, see if he can. Great. Yeah, he's got to go 10, 12 pounds. Yeah. Here, do you want to hold him? Oh, look at this. There we go. Oh, Collins is bigger. Almost any sand eel imitation will work, but the two most common patterns you will find out here would be the Clouser Minnow and the Deceiver. The most effective color is chartreuse over white. I think that one has teeth, Mike. It's looking like one. Good job. Good job. I think it's a striper. Uh, we're here on Watch Hill Reef. Um, it goes from 30 up to 12. These fish sit on here in the outgoing tide. Um, this, this is a big bass spot. Well, I did what you told me, and I, I did a some short little pause retrieves, and that seemed to really work. 
Oh, yeah, nice fish. You really need the fighting butt with these. Yes, they, they, they pull. Right, bring them up. Yep. It's 20 pound. <laughs> Test them at the tip. Two rocks are good for you. Just right over here. Isn't that beautiful? See all the sea lice? This fish is fresh. Big wide tail, power. Good job. Great. Great. When you're fishing a sinking line like this, you want to keep your leader short. The reason is that you're fishing a sinking line to get your fly down. And a leader, a long leader, like a nine-footer, would tend to buoy the fly up above the bottom. So to keep the fly riding at the same level as your sinking line, keep the leader short. Six feet or under, you can use a, you can use a knotless leader, a knotted leader, or you can even use a straight piece of, say, 20-pound monofilament, because you're not talking about delicacy here. You're talking about just keeping the fly riding behind the fly line. When striper fishing, you don't have much time to cast to the fish, as they're always moving. Stepping on the line has ruined many critical casts. Going barefoot in the boat helps you know exactly when you are stepping on your line. So what we have here is a school of fish off this big reef. There's a bunch of big fish in here. They're feeding on sand eels, we think, and we're all alone. There's no other boats running these fish down. So we're trying to stay on the edge of the school, not to run right up to the fish because we risk spooking them and then they might go down for good. So we're just kind of picking around the edges trying to quietly get into the school so we can get a cast into the fish that are feeding. And if you can't get it right over the, the mass of fish that are fairly tight, you're probably not going to get a strike. So we're trying to be really careful here. That's a nice one. It wasn't that big. Uh, I don't know. You know, I think he took it sinking. I think you're going to be uh, surprised. Yeah? I think so. <coughs> Thanks, Mike. I think that fish right there is touching 30 inches. You're kidding me. No, I think he is. Wow. I could be wrong, but i seen a i seen a flash. Yeah, I saw a flash, too. When a fish sounds like this, you want to try to put side pressure on them and not lift straight up. And be careful when the line goes under the boat. Whoa, Mike, you might be right. No, I'm, I know I'm right. I've seen them. When a fish is right below the boat like this, you want to try to keep that rod from gumming above your waist. So you want to give a quick lift and then reel, and then a quick lift and then reel, and never bring that rod up too high. So the fly rod just isn't meant when a fish is right under the boat to be brought right up here over your head. Another thing you shouldn't do when fighting a decent sized fish like this, that we all do and we shouldn't, is to put your hand on the rod here to get extra leverage because a fly rod isn't meant to be flexed from here. It's meant to be flexed all the way down into the handle. And we all do it, but you shouldn't because you could break a rod that way. Notice how I'm turning them cool. side to side to disorient them, tire them out. Oh, you put on that, you put on that little dog. Yeah, I put on a little surf candy. Caught this fish on a very small, very small bait fish. I mean, talk about, uh, you know, big fish, big fly, but sometimes just a little. That's the kind of bait fish he's eating. I like that. The afternoon continued with many more fish taken. Later on, we headed back for supper with the intent on later fishing the evening worm hatch. Ah, yeah. Whoa, Colin. He didn't waste any time. No. He is, he is, he is just, oh, double. <laughs> yeah. Oh, popped off. Oh, they're eating tonight, Jim. Don't count your blessings. Come on, you. Little guy. 
very slow strip. No, nope, it is. It's always a slow strip. Just a crawl. Yeah, the breachway is that way towards the open Atlantic, so that's where he's headed. <laughs> <laughs> got a fair amount of weed on that, too, huh? I know. Yeah. That fish is towing the boat, isn't it? Yeah, except that the anchor is out, so. If he's towing the boat with the anchor out. Oh, the, no, he just turned it. I didn't know. <laughs> Come on, let's get a look at ya here. 12 pound tippet. 12 pound, yeah. But tied to a piece of mono, so. The way so. he's fishing, uh, the way he's fighting you, he could be 11. 11 what? Pounds. Really? Well, these fish have been in here for almost a month now. They have gotten fat. Wish I could see this fish. Not huge. Oh, that's a nice, nice bass. That's for a the nice worm bass. hatch. That's a very nice bass. You gonna take him or you want me to get him? I got him. Got him. He's barely, well, he's right in the jaw, right in the corner. Yeah, right in the corner. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The New Fly Fisher. We've certainly had a great time with Captain Jim Barr and Captain Mike Warkey on the coast of Rhode Island. Don't forget to visit us at our website at thenewflyfisher.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. The New Fly Fisher has been made possible thanks to Islander Precision Reels and Orvis Sporting Traditions.